Good morning, everybody. It's, uh, you guys are a loud bunch this morning. I like that. Lots of chatting. If you're still coming in, there's still seats in the front, but not as many as normal. So thanks, you all, for filling up the front seats. And uh, let's stand up. We got a few songs to, to start off our morning here. Remember those walls that we called sin and shame They were like prisons that we couldn't escape But He came and He died and He rose Those walls are rubble now Remember those giants we called death and grave they were like mountains that stood in our way But He came, and He died, and He rose Those giants are dead now This is our God This is our God, this is who He is He loves us This is our God, this is what He does He saves us for the cross beat the grave let heaven and earth proclaim this is our god king jesus remember the fear remember the fear that took our breath away face so weak that we could barely pray but he heard every word every whisper now those altars in the wilderness Tell the story of His faithfulness Never once did He fail And He never will This is our God, this is who He is He loves us This is our God, this is what He does He saves us for the cross beat the grave let heaven and earth proclaim this is our god king jesus who rescued me from the grave yahweh he did who paid for all of our sin nobody but jesus who pulled me out of the pits he did he did who paid for all of our sin nobody but jesus who rescued me from the grave yahweh yahweh who gets the glory and praise nobody but jesus who rescued me from the grave yahweh yahweh who gets the glory and praise nobody but him this is our god this is who He is, He loves us. This is our God, this is what He does. He saves us. For the cross beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. He bore the cross. For the cross beat the grave. Let heaven and earth proclaim. This is our God, King Jesus. Let's pray. King Jesus, we come to you this morning um, just in expectation for what you are going to do in this place and in our hearts this morning. And so we, we invite you to speak to us. We invite you to inhabit our praises as we lift up our praises to you. And uh, yeah, have your way in this place this morning, Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, let's uh, take a moment. We'll greet some, uh, some of those around us. And then we'll continue on.
You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You, my God, you saved my soul. I was lost. I was lost. When you came for me, held in chains by the enemy, but you broke them in victory. I am free, I am free, you're my joy, and you are my hope. I am saved by your grace alone. I will sing of your love for me. I am free, I am free, sing it out. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You, my God, you saved my soul. Now I stand with the King of kings. He has paid for my every sin and from now through eternity i am free i am free you my god have saved my soul i am yours forevermore i won't be moved of this i'm sure you my god you save my soul Once was dead is now alive. You gave to me the breath of life. You brought me up out from the grave. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. Once once was dead is now alive. You gave to me the breath of life. You brought me up out from the grave. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. I'm bursting out with songs of praise. Come on, church, let's just sing it out. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You, my God, you save my soul. You, my God, have saved my soul. I am yours forevermore. I won't be moved of this, I'm sure. You, my God, you save my soul.
please come and come celebrate it with us on easter sunday which is march thirty first this year at nine thirty a m in fact you will be continuing over spring break on a regular wednesday time if you're not You can stand if you feel like standing. His blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness seems to hide His face, I rest on His unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. His covenant, His blood supports me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, He then is all my hope and stay. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. 
All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. This is our hope we have. When he shall call with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. All our hope is in Jesus. Nothing else. Everything else in life is like sinking sand compared to Jesus. commands all the host of heaven who else could make every king bow down who else can whisper and darkness trembles only a holy God what other beauty demands such praises the other majesty holy God. What other majesty rules with justice? Only a holy God. Come and behold Him, the one and the only Christ. Sing holy forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. What are the glory? What other glory consumes like fire? What other power can the dead what other name remains undefeated only a holy God come on church let's raise our voices come and behold him the one and the only cry out sing holy for the holy God. Come and behold Him, the one and the only. Cry out, sing holy, forever a holy God. Come and worship the holy God. could rescue me from my failing who else would offer his only son who else invites me to call him father only
only a holy God. Lift your voices. so holy that we cannot even imagine how glorious it is around your throne and it is amazing that because of the blood of Christ we can come before you in worship and we can bow down our hearts before you and say that you are our king you are our God Giving you my heart and all that is within. I lay it all down for the sake of you, my King. I'm giving you my dreams. I'm laying down my rights. I'm giving up my pride for the promise of new life. And I surrender all to you, all to you. And I surrender all to you, all to you. I'm singing. This song, I'm waiting at the cross, and all the world holds dear. I count it all as lost for the sake of knowing you, for the glory of your name, to know the lasting joy, even sharing in your Verse 1 is just a, it's just a prayer as we wrap up our worship time. Let's be a prayer from our hearts. I'm giving you. I'm giving you this heart and all that is within. I lay it all down for the sake of you, my King. I'm giving up my dreams. I'm laying down my rights. I'm giving up my pride for the promise of new life. Yes, God. Amen. You can be seated.
Good morning, church. It's good to be together. And for those that are visiting, we're glad you're with us. We uh, have been going through a series in Colossians, and we're in the middle part of Colossians about uh, going through the growing, pra- growing pains and uh, the exercise program. We're going to talk about staying in shape today. But Sunday, this Sunday, is uh, what we traditionally call Palm Sunday. <clears throat> and uh, when we were singing, I Surrender, contrast with what the Jews were singing when Jesus came in on a, on a donkey into Jerusalem through the Golden Gate, and we were there in 2016 at the, at the entrance to Jerusalem, and uh, that Golden Gate is all blocked up. You can't get in. They're trying to prevent the coming of Jesus. Just uh, 2,000 years late, they missed it. Um, it's an amazing sight to see because there's such intention by mankind to prevent the Messiah, prevent Jesus coming. In Psalm 2, it says that God sits in the heavens and laughs at the, that kind of attitude, at the attitude that says, let us tear apart those fetters, those, those things, that limitations that God has put upon us, and God sits in the heavens and laughs at them because he came in such a way that he was, in a sense, almost unrecognizable. If you were coming as the King of kings and Lord of lords, just think of the processional that you would want to have happen if you were part of that planning process. You probably wouldn't want to come in on a stinky donkey. You know, I, I personally would like to come in on a Ferrari. That's just, that's just me. I like the idea. You know, and if there's palm branches there, you know, easier to spin the tires, I think it would be amazing. But in order to fulfill the prophecy that Isaiah spoke about, he came in on a donkey. And that donkey was so prepared that when he sent the disciples to find that donkey, he was found, that, that animal was found just the way Jesus had told them it would be found, as a declaration that Jesus is in control of everything that's happening. He said himself, nobody takes my life, I give it freely. So think about I surrender, and maybe the, the people, as Jesus is coming in, they're throwing down their coats and their palm branches, and they're saying the, the, from the Psalms, Hosanna, which means, save us, Lord. Hosanna, save us, Lord. And that's what they're crying out, as David cried out, God, save us. We need to be saved. But in their mind, even though they never acknowledged under the, the Roman authority, in their mind... They're wanting Jesus to be a political deliverer. And so they'll surrender to Jesus. They'll cry out, Hosanna, save us, as long as Jesus does the program that they had envisioned he should be doing. And I meet many believers the same way, disillusioned, because Jesus hasn't done the things that they thought he should be doing, as if he's some kind of genie that gives us three wishes. So he comes in on a donkey, a foreshadowing of the disappointment that he would be in just a week. Those same group of people who are saying, Hosanna, save us, Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They're thinking deliver from the Roman political situation that we're under. Just a week later, they're crying out, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And uh, that gives us an indicator of what we've been talking about in the book of Colossians. It says, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and understanding. But because they didn't believe who Jesus is, the claims that he made, the miracles that he did, that verified exactly who he is, because they didn't believe, they couldn't see. That's why Jesus says to, to um, Doubting Thomas, that wasn't his first name and Thomas wasn't his last name, we call him Doubting Thomas. Thomas is simply like you and I. He's investigating. He wants to see if these claims of Christ are true. And he simply said, I will not believe, this is after the resurrection, I will not believe unless I see. The word see, if you look it up, means unless I understand. And Jesus meets Philip right where he's at. Sorry, Thomas, right where he's at. Right? And he says, see the nail prints? Put your hand on my side. And he's embarrassed, probably. But Jesus says to him, blessed are those who do not see or do not understand and yet believe. See, in our North American culture, we want to, we, we demand that we would understand first and then we believe. But in God's economy, we have to believe first, not in fairy tales, not in wishful thinking, 
You have to believe in the truth. And Jesus says, the truth is noble, not an opinion. The truth is noble. You shall know the truth, for I am the truth, and the truth will set you free. So the question is, do we believe that? And so as we've been looking at in Colossians, we've been looking at these kind of growing pains, growing up, all the treasures of wisdom and understanding are found in Christ. For many, many believers, that wisdom and understanding is just what Jesus did 2,000 years ago, which we'll celebrate, Lord willing, next week on Good Friday, the recognition that just a week later the people said, crucify him, and he willingly gave up his life. Greater love hath no man than he lay down his life for his friends. He gave up his life, and three days later, God raised him from the dead to declare to each one of us who put our faith in him that we are justified. Romans 4.25, he was raised again for our justification. But until we believe that, it's all, it's nice stories, could be Sunday school events, we could memorize all the right scriptures, and that's exactly what Paul is addressing to the Colossian church. How do we grow in the treasures and wisdom and understanding that are found in Christ and not in the world? And so I've entitled this morning, I've called it Staying in Shape. So you've, you've heard me confess last week about my friend in Ontario who took me on all of his, uh, he, was a gym, he is, was a gym teacher and he took me on all these uh, exercise uh, equipment at his gym. And in the middle of the night after that exercise program, even though I ate carbs, in the middle of the night I woke up with my arms straight in the air, it had seized, but all the blood had ran out of it and I thought I was going to die. Because I not only wasn't in shape, I had no um, muscle <laughs> strength to even, uh, the next week as I was teaching in Quebec, I had to sit on a stool and ask the students just to, I'm usually pretty animated, but I had to sit very, very quietly in the shower, throwing the soap onto my hair because I couldn't even put my hands above my head. That's how sore I was. And so spiritually, this growing pains which leads to strength, it says, as you've received Christ, Colossians 2.6 is what we finished with last week. As you received him, so walk in him. Being rooted and grounded in him, that's what we've been looking at up until now, the root system. What is the root system of being grounded in Christ? And now being built up in him. This is the growing. So how do you stay in shape? I have a friend, uh, I, I used to have the privilege of taking students who were kind of, they, they, you could see in them they had the, the gift of teaching and um, would like to kind of have an experience to be able to teach God's word. So I, I'd go on different trips. I was in Washington. I took him along with me. We were going through Colossians, <clears throat> and he was doing this little section, which we're going to look at today. And he said this. He says, my friend, Paul Coffey said, the best way to stay in shape is to not get out of shape. Now, what, in, intri what intrigued me about this statement was not the best way to stay in shape is to not get out of shape, but that he said, my friend, Paul Coffey. And so, you know, people are taking notes and like, okay, that's an interesting statement. But afterwards, you know, when we're kind of recapping, you know, his portion of the passage he was sharing and, and the portion that I was sharing, how, how do we link it in with chapter 3 of Colossians? I said to him, I said, this Paul Coffey you're talking about, is that the Paul Coffey, the hockey player? He smiled. He said, yep. I said, Paul Coffey is your friend? And he said, nope, but if we knew each other, we'd be friends. <laughs> Guilt by association, right? Yeah. He just knew that if he knew Paul Coffey, because Paul Coffey, that statement really connected with him, the best way to stay in shape is to not get out of it. He knew that if he had had an interaction with Paul Coffey, they'd become fast friends. And so I always remember that. And, and I like to the, uh, we like the idea of you know, New, Year, uh, New Year's resolutions, getting in shape, etc. But this maintaining or staying in shape, that daily walk, as you received Christ, how did you receive Christ? If you're a believer here, there are two things that happened. Just a reminder. You repented. Repentance is a change of mind which leads to a change of activity. Repentance simply says, I can't. I can't save myself. It's impossible. And if you'll admit that, God isn't in heaven saying, oh no, what have I done? These people can't do it. I demand holiness of them. I demand perfection of their lives. I, de I demand purity, all these things. And they can't do it. What, have, what am I going to do with them? No, he says, that's exactly where I made you. To acknowledge that fact that never changes. I can't. Repentance and faith. Faith simply says, he can. That's all faith says. Repentance, I can't. Faith, he can. 
as you've received, repentance and faith. You believed in what Jesus did 2,000 years ago. I couldn't die for my sins. I didn't have the payment to make, so I put my faith in him. So I repented. I can't. I can't make payment. And I put my faith in Jesus, who I believe paid for my sin. And the validation of that payment is God raised him again on the third day to declare that I am just before him, just before him, just as if I'd never sinned. What a freedom that can be enjoyed in this world that is trying to find their identity outside of God's purpose and creation. Our identity is in him. So as you've received, so walk. So we're looking at how do you then be built up in Christ. So I'm going to read for us um, <clears throat> chapter 2, verse 8 of Colossians to the end of the chapter, and we'll unfold it just a little bit. There's three points that I want to look at, and Paul looks at it in the negative. So he says, you want to stay in shape spiritually? He said, don't get caught. But as he said in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, I'm inviting you to the struggle. So we're all invited, every single one of us, the whole world, and we're going to declare it again on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. Everyone is invited because the whole world 2,000 years ago was forgiven. The whole world was forgiven. Think about that. Doesn't that blow your mind? 2,000 years ago, a man came riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Seven days later... They said, crucify him. He willingly gave up his life, said, it is finished. And the whole world was forgiven at that moment. Praise the Lord. Let's go charismatic a little bit this morning, brothers and sisters. Praise the Lord. We're forgiven. Once for all, forever. So it says in Hebrews 9, when Jesus comes back, he comes back for us who believe and put our faith in him without any reference to sin. Isn't that wonderful? He's not a Santa Claus. He's not keeping a list because he's looking at us through the finished work of Christ. It is finished. This gives us freedom. So we're all invited to get in the game. You're, if you're not in the game, repent, say, I can't, and say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you died for me. Thank you. I'm putting my faith in you for what you've done on my behalf. And now you get to get in the game. As you received, so walk. And that might have happened right now. At that moment, you're in the game. Welcome to the contest where Jesus has won. It's finished. So we're going to look at three things. Do not get taken captive. We'll see what by what. Do not get caught up in the symbols. And do not be deceived by the flesh. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, and it's, it's good because I'd encourage you after we finish to take your Bible and read it. Take some time in the afternoon and read this passage. So Colossians 2 verse 8, it says this. See to it. So this is our responsibility. It's not Jesus' responsibility. It's not Paul's responsibility. Church, see to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. For in him, Jesus, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form, and in him you have been made full. And he is the head and ruler over all authority or power uh, to act. Verse 11, and in him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through faith in the working of God who raised him, Jesus, from the dead. And we'll celebrate that in a week, Lord willing. Verse 13, and when you were dead in your transgressions and uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with Jesus. Having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees which were hostile, against, uh, hostile to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. When he disarmed the rulers and authorities, he made a public display of them through having triumphed over them through him. We'll stop there and we'll, we'll take the next section. So this is the first one. Don't get caught. How? Through philosophy and empty deception. Now, is there any, anything wrong? Philosophy means the love or pursuit of wisdom. Now, we, were, we already read in the earlier chapter in Colossians that in Christ is the wisdom. So does God want us to be dumb and not to think? That's not what he's saying. 
Paul's saying there's a love or pursuit of wisdom, and remember, in Christ is wisdom or skill, the ability. So if you're looking outside of Christ for wisdom and you're loving that kind of wisdom, it's absolutely worthless and it's called empty deception. So he says, don't get taken captive by that. Well, what does that mean? First of all, the love or pursuit of wisdom and empty deceit means there's nothing in it. Has anyone ever been deceived? Anyone willing to admit that? <laughs> I hate being deceived. Any, do, you, do you know that feeling when you've been deceived? I was taking a group of students um, uh, to, uh, on a ministry trip to Ashcroft, and we had, I think we had three different 15-seater vans, and as we're driving along, I was in the lead vehicle because I was leading the trip, so the leader should lead, I guess. And so I had a couple of students who had their class four driver's license and they were in the other vehicles. But we had, it was in the days of CB radios. So we were, we were communicating with CB radios and uh, we would, you know, because we were, we were moving at a fairly quick pace, we were able to pass vehicles. Well, we were passing semis and uh, the third vehicle that gets by it, of our group can sometimes be a little bit slow for the semis. And if they're going downhill and they're, they're trying to get speed to get up the next hill, you know, I thought, well, let's just speed up a little bit so that we can allow this semi driver not to be so upset with us as he makes the climb up into the mountains. And so I, I told the, the, stu the two students who were driving, I said, we need to speed up a little bit just as we get by, get down into the valley as we make the climb so that we can allow that driver so he's not so much on our bumper and upset that he has to gear down and, you know, lose his momentum. And they're like, okay. But all of a sudden, I get this, breaker, breaker, one nine. <laughs> Are those those three vans that just passed us? I'm like, yes, it is. <laughs> I thought, oh, great. We're going to have a little evangelistic meeting here. What are you fellas doing out there on the road there? <laughs> well, we're going to different churches, and we're, we're, we're testifying of Jesus. We have a group of students. We're from a Bible school in Vancouver. I'm, I'm going on the airways for about three minutes telling us about the testimonies and the special music that we're doing and we're, what passage of the Bible. He says, well, that's great. Lord bless you. Have a good, have a good trip. You know, I thought, oh, that was great. We had a great interaction with, with this trucker guy. So that night at supper, <clears throat> we're going through... I think we're, we're all at somebody's house, a, a family from the church invited us over, a big picnic outside and whatever, and, and so we're in the line, and all of a sudden I hear, breaker, breaker, one, nine, <laughs> going through the lineup, are you? <laughs> and I knew it was one of those students that had deceived me into thinking that I was speaking to a truck driver when I was just <laughs> talking to the students about the gospel. <laughs> I was so mad. I made him share his testimony that night <laughs> and preach the passage as well. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> but that's the feeling. And this is what Paul is saying. Don't get captive. Don't get taken captive through philosophy, empty deception. In other words, it sounds so logical. And we make decisions in our lives based on it sounds so right, but it's an absolute separation from the person of Christ. And this is why, as you've received Christ, repentance and faith, so walk in him, being rooted and now being built up in him. Many of us, and, and this is our pursuit as believers, we need to continue to press on to know the depth of Christ because we're so impacted by the world. And, and what does Paul say? Either the love of wisdom or pursuit of wisdom or this empty deception. It sounds really good, but it's empty. There's nothing in it. Well, I think on this same trip, just to get back at these students. We were going down to Summerland. Yeah, so human, that's right. Yeah, this human wisdom, I'm just giving you a negative, so don't do what Pastor Lawrence did. <laughs> I knew that we were meeting a, 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 a sergeant from the RCMP uh, down in Oliver, and so he had met us, and, and we were driving along, and uh, he knew about my dad and being an RCMP officer and some of the things, stories that I would share with the students. And he said, hey, Lawrence, let the, let the one van, let them pass. I'm like, okay. So I let them pass. Because they knew they were going. We're out of the mountains. We're just going to Oliver, I think, from Summerland or whatever. And uh, so he says, now just slow down. He put, my, put his hand on my, just slow down. Let him go around the, the corner <laughs> of the hill. I'm like, why? Well, I got some buddies on the other side. They're going to pull him over. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, this is great. So as you get around the corner, there's the lights flashing. 
we slow down, we slowly drive around, and there's the guy spread on the, on the hood. <laughs> it was wonderful. <laughs> they took him in, fingerprinted him, took his picture. It was wonderful. <laughs> he came back afterwards, and I said, so what was that like? He says, it was so scary. I went through all the things in my mind, all the things that I, di- I thought I got away with that I didn't get caught for, and I wondered if I got caught for some of those things. He had a guilty, guilty conscience, right? But he says, they put me in a little holding cell, and they told me when to go to the bathroom. They told me I need to go over here to take fingerprints. They, they had total control of my life. That's what it means to be held captive. He had total control. Told him you know, when to do his business, when to eat, just for a couple hours. It was wonderful because this guy was very, very happy to be free and to be uh, enjoying freedom in Christ after that. It was wonderful. So this is the idea. Don't get taken captive through philosophy and empty deception. Well, how do you know it's philosophy and empty deception? The nature of deceit or lies is, is as close you can get to the truth without it being Truth. So how do you know you're being deceived? Well, he tells us. It's according to the tradition of men. That's what we read. And according to the elementary principles of this world. What does that mean? So don't get taken captive through philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men and according to the elementary principles of the world. Well, the tradition of men is mankind, since the fall, has been reasoning in man's own human wisdom and understanding. This is what mankind is doing today in rejection of Christ. We're reasoning out climate change. We're reasoning out all these things without true wisdom and understanding that's found in Christ alone. And so you get taken captive according to the tradition of man. What's the, what's the tradition? It means what's been handed down generation after generation. Mankind living and acting and thinking in independent for, independency from God. That's tradition of men just living and thinking outside of God. According to the elementary principles of the world, in contrast to, and we're going to see in chapter 3 of Colossians, if you've been raised with Christ, you're seated in the heavenly places. In other words, you have a different mindset. So the tradition handed down, this is how mankind has behaved for generations in independence from God and according to the elementary principles of this world. What is the elementary principles of this world? I can do it without God. I can do it. That's how you know it's, it's uh, f- the pursuit of philosophy and empty de- uh, deception, and you're going to get caught. So through fallen man and earthly or temporary reasoning. Sounds very logical. And this is why, as we're, we're coming up, in, in, um, David's going to talk about it in April, but we're, t- we're coming up to a congregational meeting, and we're going to see what God is thinking about his body, the church. We're going to see how God has organized his body on earth to be a light to the world. Not our opinion, but how God has done it. So that we can walk in confidence so that the light can shine clearly. And so, question. Are you captive by just the logic that comes from being independent from God? Or just the elementary? It's normal to society. This is the way we operate. In a fallen, in an earthly and temporary system. Well, here's the best way to know that it's outside of of Christ's wisdom. He says, rather than according to Christ. So this is how you know. You evaluate things not according to, well, I like what the preacher said, so it must be true, or I like the number of people gathered, so they must must know what they're doing. There's a group of us together. No, our reasoning, that's human reasoning. Our reasoning is, is this according to Christ? So don't get taken captive through philosophy, empty deception, according to the tradition of men, men who live and independent from God, according to the elementary principles of the world. In other words, we're living and making decisions based on this temporary life rather than an eternal perspective, rather than according to Christ. Now, here's the teaching. This is amazing. And if you'd get nothing else, just if you could just hang on, pay attention to this. Look at this verse. It says in verse 9, for in him, Jesus... The fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. So all all that God is, deity, God, dwells in Jesus in bodily form. 
The fullness of God, I'm going to say it in different ways, the fullness of God dwells in Jesus. So when Jesus rides in on a donkey on Palm Sunday, he doesn't care if he's not riding in a Ferrari because he has the fullness of God in him. He has the the fullness of God in him. Now, it gets better in case you think that's cool. Look at this. It says this. And verse 10, and in him you have been made full. So what can you conclude? This is not human wisdom or logic or empty deception. Here's divine logic and divine wisdom. God, in the fullness of God, dwelt in Jesus for 33 years as a man. All that God is dwelt in him. Now, all that Jesus is dwells in us. So if we think we need to act outside of who Jesus is in us, that's empty deception And that's just pursuit of wisdom rather than pursuit of Christ. Fullness of God in Christ. Christ makes us full. Are you full? You ever had a great meal and you're full? doesn't mean you can't eat anymore. It just means you are completely satisfied. Where's the couch? That's what I say. When I'm full, where's the couch? I'm completely satisfied. This is what Jesus is to us if you'll believe him. Most just relegate Jesus to a historical figure 2,000 years ago who died and rose again for my sins, but has no relevant purpose for me in me today. And this is where we get taken captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, men living without God and the elementary principles of this world, living in a temporary logic rather than eternal. Fullness of God in Christ, Christ makes us full. Now look what he then does. He is the head and ruler over all things. Rule means to begin, to initiate. That's what the word rule means. Now, often you'll hear people preach, he is the head over all rule and authority, and and they limit that, and it's true. He is the the head and ruler over all rule on this earth, political rule, whatever, and authority. He is over that, but it's more than that. Jesus is over the beginning, the initiating and the power to act. That's what authority is. The rule means to initiate, and authority means the power to act. Does that make sense? So he is the head over all rule, the initiator, and the power to act on what he's head of. And then he illustrates that in two things. Now note, he doesn't talk about baptism and communion. What does he talk about? Circumcision and baptism. See, he's linking the old and the new together. So in Christ, you are made full. And this is, if you allow him as head and rule over all authority, in other words, he initiates in your life, that's ruling. He initiates, not you. He is Lord. He's in charge. He has the right to rule. He initiates, and then he is the authority. He has the power to act for you. Look what he does. And this is a description, then, of what it means to be circumcised. Verse 11 And in him you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands in the removal of the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. So what's the picture of circumcision? The cutting away of that attitude that says, I can rule, I can initiate in my life, and I have the power to act. That's philosophy and empty deception according to the tradition of men and the elementary principles of this world. That is how the world has operated for thousands of years in independence from Christ. But the church is not that way. This is why in him are hidden the treasures of wisdom and understanding. So the question I leave with you is, do you know this Jesus? Do you have a relationship with him? How, if you had to tell somebody who, who's, who says, tell me about Jesus, how much would you be able to tell about Jesus to that person? Merely history or contemporary? Would you be able to tell him today what he's done in your life, what he's revealed, what he's initiating as the ruler? As he cuts away the flesh. Why is the circumcision message there? Because he wants to cut away that attitude of the flesh. See, repentance says, I can't. Faith says, he can. But pride says, I can. And that's the attitude of the flesh. And how do we overcome the attitude of the flesh? That attitude that says, I can do it? Let Jesus cut it away. This is the growing pains, and this is how we stay in shape. He cuts it away. And then secondly, it says this, and in him you have been baptized. 
Verse 12, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised up with him through, the, through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. When you were dead in your transgressions and uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions. So this is what it means for Jesus to be the ruler, and he's over all rule and authority. He initiates, and he has the power to act. What does it mean? He cuts away the flesh, and he allowed his Father to do all the power and the authority. He died for our sins. By faith in him, we died by faith. We didn't die for our sins, but we put our faith in him. By faith, we died with him. Now, who raised Jesus from the dead? Jesus didn't. He submitted to his Father. God raised him from the dead. And that's what Paul is saying. As the power to act, God raised Jesus from the dead, and he gives life to our mortal bodies. Folks, this is what you and I can enjoy today. Allowing Jesus to cut away that attitude that says, God, I can go it alone. I can do it. And allow us by faith to be buried with him, That's to leave, the purpose of a burial service is to leave what is dead behind and then walk in faith as God raised Christ from the dead so he gives life to our mortal bodies. Why is that so important? Well, look at the next verse. It says this. Sorry. Next verse says, verse 14, having canceled out the certificate of debt debt consisting of degrees against us and which were hostile towards us, he has lifted it up out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. What is this certificate of debt? Well, if we have this attitude, especially we're going to be good Christians, then that appealed in this generation. The Jews were saying, oh, that's great that you put your faith in Jesus, but now you have to do good works for Jesus. Again, that's human wisdom, according to men, tradition of men. That's living life and independence from God and according to the elementary principles of the world. Here's the situation. I've got to do something about it because God, he, he, he may be in charge, but he's not active. So what what does it mean, having canceled out the certificate of debt? In the law, if you brought at about 12 or 13 years old your sin sacrifice, your annual sin sacrifice, you would bring it, the priest would take that sacrifice, kill it, and then take the blood into the Holy of Holies on your behalf, and your sin would be covered for one year. It's like an IOU. So you take an innocent lamb, kill it, And for one year, your sin was covered for your previous years of sin. So the next year, your debt would come up again. And you'd have to go to the temple, take an innocent lamb, kill it. The blood would be given to the priest. The priest would go into the Holy of Holies, and your sin would be covered for another year. So if you followed this through till you were 80, you have 80 years worth of sin that is merely, it's still there, it's just covered temporarily, because we're told in Hebrews 10 that the blood of bulls and goats cannot remove sin. That's the certificate of debt, that, we are, that if, we're, if we go under the law, the law cannot remove sin. And so God made a provision in the, in the picture of an innocent lamb that, that blood would cover this, our sin for one year. But when Jesus came, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, he took that certificate and he canceled it. Why? Because his blood was way more powerful than the blood of bulls and goats. Man sinned. Man had to pay the price for sin. So God became a man. His name is Jesus, and he paid for our sin to cancel out the debt. How did he do that? He lifted them up on a cross, made a public display of them, it says. Look at this. it It wasn't a hidden thing. It was a public display. Verse 15, when he disarmed the rule and authority. This is going back to that verse we just read. What did Jesus do? By put, lifting it up and putting it on a cross, all of that certificate of debt, he puts it on a cross and he disarms all rule and authority. In other words, you don't have to do it anymore. Isn't that good news? You don't have to do it anymore. You just have to put your faith in Christ who has done it completely, once for all, forever so that you can enjoy him ruling and having the authority to power to act in your life. He made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through Jesus. This is what it means for Jesus to be 
over, head over all rule and authority. So you can either today think with human logic, life and independence from God, or with Christ's mind, independence upon Him, so that He might initiate as the ruler and give you the power to act as the authority to rule in our lives. It's a wonderful passage, and this is what Palm Sunday was supposed to be about. Save us, Lord. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So that's the ideal, and then he makes two smaller statements in verse 16. I'll read it for us. Uh, don't get caught up in the symbols. Therefore, I'll re- I put it up on the overhead because it's a little bit smaller. Therefore, let no one, sorry, therefore, no one is to act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in respect to a festival or a new moon Sabbath, sorry, a new moon or a Sabbath day, things which are a mere shadow of that which is to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one keep defrauding you of your prize by delighting in self-abasement and the worship of angels, taking his stand on visions which he has seen, inflated without cause by his fleshly mind." Not holding fast to the head, what is the head? Over all rule and authority. Not holding fast to him who initiates and him who has the power to act. From whom the entire body, being supplied and held together by joints and ligaments, grows with a growth which is from God. What does that mean? Well, there's a temptation in our flesh. We wake up in the morning and we say to God, there's some, I know that you're the head and rule over all authority and you have lifted up, canceled out that certificate of death and now you rule in my life. I know that's true, but I wake up in the morning and, and say, there's something that I can do. There's got to be something that I can do. And so the temptation is to subtly go back to, in their case, Judaism. And this kind of goes in waves. Uh, um, I was in Ontario a few years ago, and we were on a kind of a peak wave. There were lots of people that I was meeting that were turning back to Judaism. They, and the reasoning was, if, G, if Jesus was under the law, then we too should be under the law. That was the reasoning. I have a friend who I replaced at Cape and I told you about. I taught Revelation, and he, he taught Revelation. He, he's not doing well. He, he's ill. But he, he said, as a Jewish man, people said, oh, isn't it great that you're a Jew, you understand the law and all the nuances of the temple and the sacrificial system and the Levites and all that? He says, no, that's a burden to me. I'm so thankful that I have Jesus. But they were wishing that they had what he had. Folks, this is what Paul is addressing. Don't get caught by the symbols. What are the symbols? They are the things in the law the festivals, all these things that are pictures of Christ. This is what Paul describes. They're a mere shadow, but the substance points to Jesus. What's the point of a shadow, right? A shadow leads to the real thing. When our kids uh, were in in Thetis Island, there would be the odd sunny day in the rainy time. And when it was a sunny day, our kids thought it was great because we'd be coming home from school or after supper, go for a little walk. And the long sunset, just before it set down, at, I think at 1230 in the daytime. No, it was a little later than that. <laughs> just before the sun, there would be long shadows. And my kids would run around and they'd say, Dad, there's your head. And they'd run up and jump on my head on the shadow. And I'd go, oh, no. And they thought it was great. And so they'd run and jump again. And I'd duck. And they'd say, oh, you missed me. And they would be having a great time playing with my shadow. Can you imagine if I came home and said, Daddy's home, kids, let's go play. And they, they open up the curtains and look and said, uh, Dad, it's raining on Thetis Island. There's no, there's no sunlight today. I, I'm like, what's the, what's, what's the problem with that? I'm here. Uh, Dad, but we wanted to play with your shadow. We didn't want to play with you. We want to play with your shadow. Folks, this is what it means. We get caught up on the symbols and the, and the, and the law, which was, it had a purpose. Galatians tells us the purpose of the law is to lead us to Christ. So we get caught up in the symbols or the shadows and forget the real thing. Can you imagine how I felt if they would do that? I would say, but I'm here. Daddy's home. But Dad, we just want to play with your shadow. Imagine how Jesus feels when we just get caught up on the shadow stuff rather than the real thing. See, the purpose of the law, the purpose of the festivals, the purpose of everything was a shadow to lead us to the authentic, to Christ. And then he says this, let no one keep defrauding you. So let no one act as your judge in regard, you can practice a Sabbath day or not, but that's not where it is, as long as you're reminded of the substance of it. But he says, let no one keep defrauding you. The word defrauding means act as an umpire. You're out, 
safe, right? You're making a judgment against people. Well, what, what are they doing? They're making a judgment against people outside of the law. Oh, you didn't have a vision of angels? Oh, I did. I saw golden dust fall from the ceiling. I've seen angels standing behind cemeteries. All these weird things that, I'm sorry to say, are taking people captive. Taking people captive. Why? Because it's outside of Christ. Many people want experiences, but don't want to settle for the real thing. Let no one act as your umpire, keep defrauding you, focusing on things outside of Jesus as the head and rule over all authority. Don't get caught, it's our responsibility. And then lastly, lastly, if you have died with Christ, the last section, verse 20, if you've died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why is if you're living in the world do you submit yourselves to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, with all, which all refer to things destined to perish with the use? In the accordance with the commandments and teachings of men, what do we already know about the commandments of men or the tradition of men? Acting in independence from God. These are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom and self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Don't be deceived by the flesh. What is the flesh? That attitude that says, God, I can do it. When you save me, you got a good man on your team, God. Oh, man, you got a good person. I can do it. Many Christians live this way. Many people elevate people into high positions in Christian circles because they give the impression that they live that way. And then when they stumble and fall, we're shocked. Why? Because we put our faith in that person rather than Christ. We put our faith in the shadow rather than the message of the shadow. Ravi Zacharias is a great example. They wanted him to do all this speaking about apologetics and all these things, and he had wonderful things to say, but we elevated him above his position. And when it was found out that he had fallen, I know people that walked away from the faith because their faith was in the shadow. Don't be deceived by the flesh. Submitting to your own self-effort, that's what it means. Why do you submit to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch? This is my self-effort, but it's very appealing. Why do we do it? It looks good. Self-abasement, severe treatment of the body. Oh, look, I'm suffering for Jesus. Right? You ever worn a, worn a humble badge? I'm humble. Right? You can't do that. That means you're proud of your humility. It's impossible. And so don't submit... Sorry, don't be deceived by the flesh, the flesh that says, I can do it in my own self-effort. It's taught and promoted rapidly, rampantly in our culture, brothers and sisters, in Christian church and in the world outside. What distinguishes us in the church and outside of the church? What distinguishes us? Christ. Not a historical figure merely, but somebody who's raised again and now indwells us. The head and rule, ruling my life, and the power to act. Why do we like those things of the flesh? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, according to the commandments and teachings of men. Please note, the commandments and the teachings were by God. God gave them these commandments. So when does God's commands become the commandments and teaching of men? When man obligates you to do it outside of faith in Christ. That's as simple as it is. So God's commandments become man's commandments when man tries to do it without God. Why do we do it? It looks good, but here's what Paul says at the end of the verse, but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. It doesn't help. I have a friend who was the, is the principal in, in Quebec, and he'd, meet, he'd had some pretty interesting stories of students. But one uh, guy student came to him and he said, I got a real problem with lust. And I just need to let you know at, at, at this time, like, I, I really struggle with it. And my psychologist said, here's philosophy, <laughs> take an elastic band, and when you have a lustful thought, snap that elastic band, because it'll create pain with that lustful thought, and you won't want to do it. So this principal would be teaching in Bible school, and all, he, all of a sudden you hear a snapping of an elastic, and only he and that person knew what was happening. He would come to the office and come to the office and say, do you have any more elastics? <laughs> because he'd break elastics. Because the flesh had deceived him. He couldn't do it. He was taken captive by human 
philosophy. So he thought if he just snapped his wrist, with the, he would have victory over lustful thoughts, and he found himself a failure, and he ran out of elastic bands. Folks, that's called the Christian self-help programs. We need Christ today and allow him as the ruler, the one who initiates, and the authority, the power to act, to cut away the flesh, to be united with him in death and resurrection so that we might live abundantly and have victory over the flesh. So in conclusion, we needed to have a new or a correct attitude or a new mindset. So here's the mindset. Verse 20, if you've died with Christ. So all you have to do is wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I'm dead. What does that mean? It doesn't mean you're, you don't have life. It just means you're saying, God, I don't have the capacity to live the way you want me to live. You've died with Christ. In other words, in that attitude, I'm not going to submit to my fleshly mindset, which says I can do it. Now, unfortunately, there's a chapter division, chapter 3, verse 1. The actual chapter division should be chapter 3, verse 5. So the thought continues. Here it is. If you've been raised with Christ, keep seeking the things above where Christ is seated. At the right hand of God, set your mind on things above and not on things of the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will be revealed with him in glory. So what's the attitude? How are we going to stay in shape? I'm dead with Christ to sin. I don't need to submit to that fleshly attitude that says, God, I can do it without you. I can acknowledge the truth that as Christ was raised from the dead, so I too can walk in newness of life because he rules and I can have a new mindset. What's that mindset? Eternal thinking rather than earthly thinking. That doesn't mean you're not thinking of earthly things. It means in those earthly things that you have to think about, you ask God to reveal the eternal thinking in that situation. And you'll be amazed at what God does. I came home from Bible school my first year, and my youth leader said, well, Lawrence, I hope you're not too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. And I was not very encouraged by that statement. Because what he was saying to me is like, oh, you've had a whole year of Bible school. Now you're all head in the clouds and you'll be of no earthly good to anybody on earth. And that discouraged me. Because at Bible school, I met Christ as life. I had received him at six. But at Bible school, I came alive in Jesus. I started to understand that Christ wanted to live his life through me. And I thought, that's an impossibility. But do you know what I found since then? My problem will never be that I'm too heavenly minded. Do you know what my problem is? I'm too earthly minded. That's my problem. So when he's told that to me, I hope you're not too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good. I, 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 I took it to heart. And you know what? I realized I'm too earthly minded to be of any heavenly good most times. I look at my situation on earth and I say, oh, it's hopeless or I can do it. And I put Christ out of business so many times. And I'm ashamed to admit it. I'm too earthly minded to be of any heavenly good. Here's the, here's the answer. Verse 5, when Christ, who is our life, is revealed, then you will be revealed with him in glory. Folks, that's not just one day. It's true one day. When Jesus comes back, and it might be today, we'll be revealed with him in glory. But here's the scope of this. When Christ, who is our life, Christ is our life right now, is revealed through your life, what, what's going to happen? He will be revealed with you today in glory. Glory isn't a place. Glory is the manifesting presence of God. So do you want to stay in shape? Have the right mindset. Dead, alive in Christ, so that Christ, who is my life, he's the head and ruler of authority in my life, the, to begin and to act. When he is my life, is revealed today, then I'll be revealed with him in glory. What are people going to see? Christ in me. They're going to see the way God made us to, to be, brothers and sisters of the church, the body of Christ, that God himself would be displaying himself through us. When Christ, who is our life, he's our life, is revealed, you'll be revealed with him in glory. And when he comes back, what a day that will be. What a day will that, wouldn't that, is that going to be great? Maranatha, maybe today. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for our time together. Thank you that we could come together on this Palm Sunday to recognize that the people had a certain expectation of you, a mindset, a man mindset, an earthly mindset, that seven days later they were disappointed because you didn't fulfill what they thought you should do. And Lord, there may be somebody here that's exactly the same way. They think that you should be a certain way and you've disappointed them. 
Lord, thank you. Thank you for your patience that you have come to take over our lives so that we might find full satisfaction in you as our life. Thank you that as we continue now in song and reflection, I pray that we would acknowledge the truth. You abide in me. We praise you, we bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. We have a couple more songs to sing. Uh, you're welcome to stand up or you can sit as we just uh, reflect on what Lawrence uh, spoke about this morning.
listen, teach me to abide. Be my strength, my song in the night. Be my all, my treasure, my prize. I am yours forever, your mind. Draw me close and teach me to God, as we go this week, may that be our prayer, that we would just, um, we would abide in you, we would look to you, we would trust you, we would live for you, we would put you first in all things, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we have one more song, and as we go, we can sing this out. Nothing will change If all the plans I make go wrong Your love stays the same Your light will guide me through it all I'm hanging on I'm leaning into you Nothing can reach The end of all your faithfulness Your grace is with me through every shadow, every test, I'm hanging on. I'm leaning in to you. I don't know where you'll take me, but I know you're always good. My hope is built on nothing less. In your great love, your righteousness, I will not walk another way. I trust your heart, I trust your name, I'm holding on, I'm holding on to you. You are my rock. You are my rock When storms are raging all around You shelter me, God When safe with you on solid ground I'm hanging on I'm leaning in to you I don't know I don't know where you'll take me But I know you're always good is built on nothing less than your great love, your righteousness. I will not walk another way. I trust your heart, I trust your name. I hope, my hope is built on nothing less than your great love, your righteousness. Will not trust another way. I trust your heart, I trust your name. I'm holding on, I'm holding on to you. God bless all of you as you go this week. <laughs>